I have no way to defend my borders, but to extend them. Catherine the Great, the 18th century Tsarina, overseeing expansion of the Russian Empire from the Baltic to the Black Sea, captured in this phrase the essence of one of the most everlasting national interests of the Russian government. For hundreds of years, Russia has commanded more territory than any other country on earth, and yet it is ever driven to grow. Why is this? Let's discuss that today. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. The world is very complicated. And how the nations of our world interact, both historically and in the present, is not simple to explain. I've studied geopolitics for many years, and in this video, I would like to summarize a bit of what I've learned about it. Please bear in mind that, while I will do my best to touch on the relevant information as accurately as I am able, this subject is literally as complex as the entire world. I thank you in advance for your patience. A principle of geopolitics is that geography is one of its most important and stubborn facts determining a great deal about a country's capabilities and its fate. Several countries have well-defined geographical borders, like mountains and oceans. The core of Russia, however, centered around Moscow, lies on the North European plain. This corridor of relatively flat territory has allowed the Russian heartland to be invaded by the Mongols, the French, the Germans. Other invasions have come into Russia from the Turks, the Swedes, and the Japanese. Thus, the Russian geopolitical psyche for countless generations has been possessed by an inveterate paranoia. Attack could come from any side, and no mountain or sea could hope to slow it down. They could only pray for a brutal winter to deter their foes. For this reason, the Russian Empire continued to grow its territory through the centuries in order to create the only possible physical defense, more land. More land creates a buffer. The more land an army has to march through, the longer its supply lines become, and the less defensible its lines of communication. The zenith of this expansion was accomplished by the successor to the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, in the 20th century. The USSR reached nearly every possible geographic barrier. The Arctic Ocean to the north, the Carpathian Mountains in the west, to the southwest, the Black Sea, to the south, the Caucasus Mountains, the Caspian Sea, and the Karakum Desert. To the east, the Tian Shan and Altai Mountains. Moreover, all those places that invaders could use to attack the country, all nine of them, were finally plugged. The White Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Polish Gap, the Bessarabian Gap, Crimea, the Caucasus coastal approaches along the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, the Central Asian Corridor, and the Tian Altai Gap in the Far East. Moreover, the Soviets held great sway over satellite states within their sphere of influence, such as the Warsaw Pact in Eastern Europe. So when the USSR finally collapsed in 1991, from its perspective, suddenly, Russia's most vulnerable spots were again open to attack. The perennial fears of the Russian state were reignited. This is why Vladimir Putin has stated that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Well, that seems like an odd thing to say. The end of the USSR led to the liberation of millions of people who had suffered under the harsh Soviet regime. However, from the perspective of Russia's geographical security, for a country deeply paranoid about invasion, I could see why Russians could consider it to have been disastrous. It was vulnerable once again on almost every flank. The sense of safety it once had had evaporated. It was in an even worse position geographically than during the Russian Empire. All this is to attempt to explain, in part, current and historical acts of the Russian state. This geographical insecurity in no way justifies the invasions of sovereign nations or the death that follows such conquests. That said, why would Russia invade Ukraine? To those of us who live outside of Russia, this seems utterly bizarre. Yet wars of conquest are an undeniable fact of the history of the planet. Why do we regard the attempted annexation of a whole country as utterly alien, unacceptable, 
and self-evidently horrifying. And why does the Kremlin act as if it has no other choice, and what it is doing is both good and necessary? Putin has been called insane for invading Ukraine, and he has tried to justify it through long speeches about Russian and Ukrainian fraternity. Putin, in his rhetoric, has systematically devalued the Ukrainian language and Ukrainian national identity in order to declare that Ukraine has no right to be a sovereign state, and trumpets his invasions as crusades to save Russians living in Ukraine. When Hitler sought Lebensraum, breathing room, for the German people, his goal was also to connect dislocated peoples, as he saw it. German speakers in Austria, Poland, and Czechoslovakia, all under the Third Reich. But as we all know, it didn't stop there. For Berlin is also on the North European plane, like Moscow. And Germans have suffered invasions along this corridor for thousands of years. Hitler's unquenchable need to make war on the entire European continent, his pleonexia, to dominate all that he possibly could, makes sense to such a leader when there are few geographical barriers to protect the perceived homeland. Putin's and Hitler's ethnic and linguistic rationales are just a bunch of nonsense used to legitimize their territorial conquests. If the Ukrainian state were instead inhabited entirely by Tartars or some other ethno-linguistic group, Putin would have rationalized a different excuse for invasion, since the territory of Ukraine is too important to his vision of securing Russia's borders with buffer zones. The same vision of Catherine the Great and Joseph Stalin. Yet since the German heartland is nearly as vulnerable as Russia's, open to invasion for both East and West on the North European plain, why then has Germany successfully avoided being invaded and invading since the end of the Third Reich? Indeed, Germany has become a land of peace and prosperity. It's now known as a pacifistic country. How did this German metamorphosis occur? What's going on here? One of the greatest geopolitical miracles of the 20th century has been the European Union. The European Union preceded by the European Economic Community, committed to making war impossible. Well, how do you make war impossible? Well, you make it so that attack on any other country in the community would utterly destroy the livelihood of your own. Thus, secular rivals, France and Germany, have been unable to go to war with each other since World War II as their economies have become completely interdependent. This is why I hold the opinion that the European Union has been a miraculous geopolitical event, and it has succeeded in eliminating war in a place where war was the norm for thousands of years. The Soviet Union in 1945 was poised to continue taking territory in Europe, as the doctrine of expansion had never changed, and pacification of the entirety of Western Europe under Soviet influence was their objective. So how did Europe defend itself from this massive military power that had placed its tanks and artillery at the heart of Germany? One of the reasons that Western Europe had the freedom to accomplish its geopolitical miracle was that it had allied itself with the other global superpower, the United States. The United States and several European countries integrated not only their economies, but their militaries. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization began as a way to deter the Soviet Union from invading European countries not already under its influence. Thanks in part to the nuclear umbrella that the United States and later the United Kingdom and France provided to all member countries. An attack on one is an attack on all, according to Article 5 of the NATO Charter. It is not, however, an offensive alliance. It does not conquer. This is where we get a real split. You may have heard of the old terms first world countries, third world countries, during the Cold War, first world countries were what is also called the free world, the non-Soviet or non-communist world, consisting of democracies all tightly aligned together with U.S. and NATO in opposition to the second world, the Soviet Union, its Warsaw Pact, and other alliances. Other countries not in these alliances were called third world. This term third world country gradually gained a highly pejorative aspect as many of these countries were less developed 
than those in the first and second worlds. The Western Bloc, or First World, versus the Eastern Bloc, also known as the Second World. They competed politically, democracy versus authoritarianism, and economically, capitalism versus communism. But what's especially relevant today is that these different ways of thinking lead to very different geopolitical behaviors. A fascinating reality in international relations is that, up to the present day, there have been no major wars between democratic countries, in the modern sense of the term. Plenty of democracies have gone to war with non-democracies and vice versa. But the central question in political science has been, why? Why don't democracies go to war with each other? The answer seems to be that democratic countries, whose representatives are answerable both to one another and their constituents, are slow in action through a series of checks and balances. And they're constantly in the business of talking things out, of working within the confines of the law. In general, one can say that democracies are governments of laws and not of men, to paraphrase John Adams. A principle that the West, the first world, holds most dear is that laws should be just and that no one is above the law. And based on this, the first world set out to create an economic system of free trade that effectively eliminated the need for empires thanks to an extensive international legal system. So the Soviets were rather outside this order, and although they took part in the United Nations, being a permanent member of the UN Security Council since the body's founding, the Soviets didn't interact with international law quite the same way as the First World. At home, the Soviets placed the unity and preservation of the state above all else, and the leaders at the top were the embodiment of the state. Its laws and actions reflect this. The USSR was not a free society, and expressions of freedom were often suppressed violently. Unlike the world democracies, the Soviet Union was not a government of laws, but a government of men. Laws and other acts of the state were not made with the abstract concepts of liberty or justice or individual rights at their core, but were ultimately in the service of protecting and empowering these men. The rationale was that these powerful men, the philosopher kings in Plato's Republic, were necessary to keep the nation united and to defend it from its enemies, no matter how many people had to die in the name of the state. Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. While there existed the competing system of democracies or republics, democracy as an institution was deeply mistrusted by the Kremlin. Freedom of thought and of speech was deemed an intolerable threat to the state. As you can imagine, the Soviet Union at every level functioned, such as it did, with a great deal of doublespeak. Laws were there, and certainly some of them were good, just as some laws in free countries can be bad. But there existed a mindset from my reading of history that laws are not put in place for reasons of justice and protection of individual citizens, but that they could in fact be quite harmful. And thus lip service was paid to the rules, but were ignored if it meant personal survival. Laws were evaded. Authority supported openly, but skirted privately by all who dared. The people were poor, as the great majority of Russians ever have been and the Soviet system only exacerbated this poverty, deepening a mindset of oppression and fear. Even the elites at the top of the order never felt safe, always under threat, not just from their peers or the underclasses, but from abroad. Any day now the enemies might invade. No one can be trusted. Let me tell you something about humans, nephew. They're a wonderful, friendly people as long as their bellies are full and their horror suites are working. But take away their creature comforts. Deprive them of food, sleep, sonic showers. Put their lives in jeopardy over an extended period of time, and those same friendly, intelligent, wonderful people will become as nasty and as violent as the most bloodthirsty Klingon. This paranoid Soviet mentality craved security. Ultimately, power is respected in such a place. One must take charge, show strength above all else, and purge 
those who would disobey authority. And you find that impressive, isn't it? I don't think so. This is the essence of the corruption that led to the downfall of the Soviet Union. And I believe it is the mindset by which Russia's current leader understands the world. Allow me to imagine how he might be thinking. The rules of international law, the resolutions of the United Nations, these are just words that not only Russia, but the adversarial NATO countries are all just pretending to believe in for the sake of show, for the sake of deceiving other nations and their own people. NATO says it's just a self-defense pact, but their nuclear-tipped missiles can strike at every city in Russia in under an hour. And their armies are only a few hundred kilometers away. How do I know they're not lying to me? We lie to them all the time. It's part of the game. There is no way they can be trusted. And it's clear that NATO expansion and NATO support for Ukraine is an attempt to destroy the Russian state if it costs the lives of thousands, even millions. As long as it preserves the Russian nation, it will be in our best interest. That's at least my best guess in trying to understand how Putin might be thinking. I could be wrong, but based on the information that I told you today, this is how it seems to me. Now, while Putin may project his more cynical worldview onto the democratic countries of the West, the free world has also projected their respect for the rule of law and international agreements optimistically, but perhaps naively, onto Russia, expecting it will act as they do, that it will uphold its agreements under the law, that it will respect global institutions and human rights, and that it won't invade other nations without just cause. But for Vladimir Putin, the cause is just, the salvation of his people from the, quote, empire of lies, unquote which is what he calls the West. From the perspective of the free world, these comments and the invasion they are being used to validate seem utterly counter to reality. And they are, which is why people have been confused about the invasion of Ukraine and the strange excuses for it. But I opine that Putin believes all other countries' leaders to be as duplicitous and self-interested as he, projecting himself onto them, while the West expects Putin to respect the rule of international law and human dignity. It's a bit like two people speaking dialects of the same language that have significant differences in key terms, but don't recognize the confusion. Take the word pants, which in British English means underwear, and in American English means trousers. Thus, wearing pants or not can have a very different meaning depending on which side of the Atlantic you come from. It also reminds me of how modern English speakers today often misunderstand words from Shakespeare. Mean, today, means cruel. But in early modern English, it means common or poor. And when Greeks read ancient Greek, they often think they understand certain meanings perfectly. But in actuality, they're getting a completely wrong idea. For example, in modern Greek, misoti dulia, I hate work. But in ancient Greek, misoten dulian, I hate slavery. The geopolitical language of the Russian state, based on my observation, and this is merely my opinion, I could be wrong, is something like that. Not the language of the 21st century, but of the 18th century, where empires and kings mistrusted and invaded one another to gain advantage. I'd like to express my admiration for Russian language and literature. We can admire a culture without condemning the acts that occur in the society that produces that culture. We can adore Latin poetry without approving of the most heinous institutions of the ancient Romans. And we have seen that huge numbers of Russians do not think like Vladimir Putin. They seem to crave a free society. So can the geopolitical language of the Kremlin change? The geographical facts are quite stubborn. Yet Germany was able to move completely beyond such concerns. Invasion and conquest are no longer part of the German strategy. Yet they evidently are still part of the Kremlin's strategy. I think it's important for us to recognize that Ukraine is only the beginning of Putin's vision, not the end. Irrespective of the NATO alliance, Poland and the Baltic states are just as essential to Moscow's security, as is the Bessarabian Gap, where Moldova and Romania lie. The Russian state is currently pursuing its geopolitical aims, indulging itself in outright pleonexia by taking territory that it sees as rightfully Russian because Russia believes it needs it for its security. 
The Kremlin longs for this security because it does not trust the Western democracies. On the contrary, like for the Soviet Union, democracies are seen as dangerous and intolerable, an empire of lies, as Putin puts it, suspecting them as being as duplicitous as he. Now, this is all just my perspective of merely one person in a world that is infinitely complex, and it's important for me to add that I might be wrong about my assessments. I've given some links to further reading in the description. The current situation is much, much more complicated than this summary could hope to clarify. And while I hold the opinion that free societies are better than authoritarian ones, no one is saying that democracies are perfect or free from injustice. But the general opinion of European countries, especially the newest members of NATO, long oppressed by the Soviet Union, is that free societies, for all their imperfections, are better. While the sovereignty of Ukraine and its tens of millions of citizens hangs in the balance, Putin has made it clear that his war is not just with Ukraine, but with all free nations in Europe and the world. The international order that so many of us take for granted is being challenged. The Russian state is speaking the geopolitical language of centuries ago. If the Kremlin learns to trust its international partners, and if the Russian people choose for themselves a true democracy, will the Kremlin leave its imperial ambitions in the past?